Hello there, students. Welcome to Old Testament History Online. As you are well aware, I am going to be in Cambodia and serving on mission there. And so I want to make sure that we're still able to meet in class. Uh, this actually, this format's going to give you some uh, more timing as regard to reading and these sort of things because uh, these lectures being online will not have the time length they are in person. Uh, so we'll be meeting this week and next week via this YouTube video format. And then on the 15th of February, we'll meet again um, in person for those of you that are in Anchorage. One of the things I need to make you aware of is it shows on the syllabus that on the 9th, 9th of February, uh, or excuse me, the 8th of February, that we're going to have a midterm. I'm actually going to be out of town uh, that day. And uh, so we're going to go ahead and move that to the 15th. And then we are going to move the quiz number two uh, from the 22nd to the 1st. So two moves. A midterm exam moves from February 8 to February 15. And quiz two moves from February 22 to March 1st. I want to make sure that you also know that there's a quiz online in uh, Blackboard. So make sure you uh, complete quiz one. Uh, you are able to use your notes and book, as I told you. Uh, but also know there is uh, the 90 minute uh, time limit. So you have an hour and a half. You should be able to have plenty of time. But do watch that time as you go through uh, the test. We're going to be going through the Old Testament reading from last week. We covered a little bit of the reading that was due last week, but we want to go ahead and move on in to the book of Numbers. And there are a, a lot of things that we can gather from the Old Testament passages, and Numbers is included, all the Bible, from a Hebrew and a Christian perspective. Uh, for the Hebrew, the Old Testament, for the Christian Old and New Testament, um, is God's word, and therefore it's important that everything in there is important. However, when we read books, sometimes it's more difficult uh, to understand the significance. To remind you, we have oral tradition, which gives way to written tradition, and we have the two main promises to, Mo to, uh, to Abraham of land and people. When we know that there's land and people as the primary promises to Abraham, we understand that when the books in the Old Testament, such as Numbers, spend so much time talking about the land and the people that live on the land and talking about whose son was from what father and what son and father and son and father, son and father, and where they were in the land and how it was divided, that is a reflection that God has answered his promises. And so when you read that, keep in mind, that's the goal of this is to continue to unpack this idea that God's promise of land and people has been fulfilled. But also keep in mind that as you look at this, there are people who are wanting to keep their heritage alive. Uh, obviously, we have access online and via mail to some DNA testing and being able to find out our roots and all these things they did not have. And so there's, there's writing after writing after writing talking about the generation before and the generation before that and the generation before that. When it comes to Numbers, the uh, book of Numbers uh, has been called Numbers by later scholars. That was not its original Hebrew name. And the original Hebrew name is Benid, Benidbar, Benidbar uh, which means, among other things, in the desert. In and the desert. So let's talk about some blanks in your study notes. Uh, first, you have tribes that are headed towards the land. Tribes headed towards the land. This is important because they understand, again, that that was the promise. And they understand that they, as the people, not just generally any people, but the people of God, <clears throat> excuse me, are going to go into the land, and that's where they're, they're headed, but they're in the wilderness or desert because of the sins 
of the spies that came back. You remember the story where Caleb and Joshua were the only ones to say, let's go on into the Holy Land. And the rest of them said, uh, those, they look like giants. We're like grasshoppers. There's no way we're going to go in there. And because of that, all the men of fighting age, except Caleb and Joshua, including Moses himself, did not enter into the promised land. As they do this, some of the things that carry along with them are traditions. And one of those great traditions is the tradition of Passover. Passover is essential to the Hebrew DNA. And we're talking about Passover, the event that gives way to or is remembered by Passover, the meal, the celebration. And we're going to the book of Numbers. And in Numbers chapter nine, there's a detailing of the Passover feast, the Passover gathering, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's all also called because they didn't allow the bread to rise. They were in a hurry to get out of Egypt and therefore moving forward. It's Passover feast as in death passed over them, but also the feast of unleavened bread, bread without yeast in it. It says the Lord spoke to Moses in the desert in Sinai of Sinai in the first month of the second year after they came out of Egypt. He said, have the Israelites celebrate the Passover at the appointed time. Celebrate it at the appointed time at twilight on the 14th day of this month in accordance with all its rules and regulations. So Moses told the Israelites to celebrate the Passover and they did so in the desert of Sinai at twilight on the 14th day of the first month. The Israelites did everything as the Lord commanded Moses. So there's a key verse we're going to hone in on for sometimes they actually did as God said through Moses. But unfortunately, there is a but in there. You're going to see that throughout where buts change, ch buts change uh, the path of the, of the story. But there are people who are trying to figure out here, not out of disobedience, but out of pure question. Says, but some of them could not celebrate the Passover on that day because they were ceremonially unclean on account of a dead body. So they came to Moses and Aaron that same day and said to Moses, we have become unclean because of a dead body. Why should we be kept from presenting the Lord's offering with the other Israelites at the appointed time? Moses answered them, wait until I find out what the Lord commands concerning you. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites, when any of you or your descendants are unclean because of the dead, because of a dead body or are away on a journey, they are still to celebrate the Lord's Passover. But the day but they are to do it on the 14th day of the second month in twilight. They are to eat the lamb together with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They must not leave any of it till morning or break any of its bones. When they celebrate the Passover, they must follow all the regulations. But if anyone who is ceremonially clean and not on a journey fails to celebrate Passover, they must be cut off on the people for not presenting the Lord's offering at the appointed time. They will bear the consequences of their sin. A foreigner residing among you is also to celebrate the Lord's Passover in accordance with its rules and regulations. You must have the same regulations for both the foreigner and the native born. So this is central to the identity. In fact, you see how central it is when it says that you will suffer the consequences of your sin if you do not partake of Passover. This is a key moment for them. They want to remember that God has redeemed their people, has saved their people. And therefore, even the foreigners, even those that didn't experience it firsthand are going to experience it from that point forward through the feast, through the festival, through the meal, through the gathering of the people who are celebrating God's protection and God's glory and God's joy. I want to look at a few uh, passages out of verse 13 and 14 uh, where we do see this reason for the wandering that I mentioned before, and this is the expanding. So in, in chapter 13, 1 through 16, we see that they're going to go in and check the land out. It says, the Lord said to Moses, send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I will, which I am giving to the Israelites. So he says, I'm giving it. Not I might give you or someday I might give it to you, but I am giving. So we see that if they'd been obedient, this land would have immediately been given to him. Uh, think back to the covenant idea. We said that a covenant, unlike human covenant, where both sides can break, God covenant, he never breaks. And so he's going to fulfill this, but not in the timing that was intended here because of what we will find. 
Uh, notice that each tribe uh, gives a person uh, where they can go. You have the tribe of Reuben and Simeon and Judah and Issachar and Ephraim and Benjamin and Zebulun and Manasseh and Dan and Asher and Naphtali and Agad. And, Agad. and what we have here, be reminded, is a, it's a group of sons that you'll recall, Jacob, whose name is Israel, has the sons, including Levi, who's not mentioned here, and Joshua is not mentioned here. And what we end up with is 13 sons, minus Joseph, and minus Levi. But Moses is, uh, Joseph's sons replace two, and we get to 12. So remember this, you have Reuben and Simeon and Judah, etc. But then, then you see Ephraim and Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh are sons of Joseph born in Egypt. And Joshua, who will not go in, he, his heritage is through his sons. They become two separate tribes. We have, therefore, Joshua removed. And so now you're at 13 because you take one out, you add two, you're at 13. Well, Levi, the tribe of Levi is not present in this list because they are the priesthood. So Joshua doesn't go in. Uh, Joseph doesn't go in, rather. And Levi does not go in. Joseph, because his body never left Egypt and his descendants, his children take over. And Levi, because he's going to be a priest uh, and his people will be the priestly duty. So we find that they are going to go in and check out the land. And Moses says to them in chapter 13, verse 17, and it says, when Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, go up through the Negev and on into the hill country, see what the land is like and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many, what kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees in it? in it or not, do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the land. This is a scouting mission where they're supposed to come back and bring the information that will best help them prepare. Now, there's a little hint here, most likely that what's going on is Moses is going to be asking these questions about what lies ahead, which I wonder if it puts a little uncertainty in their heads. Moses has already been told this land is going to be given to you. Now, as a good leader, he's asking questions about the land. But when he's asking about how strong they are and how they, if they might be defeated, in other words, he's beginning to question, are our people strong enough to do this, to be the ones that help fulfill God's plan? And there's some hesitation in there, which we don't want to read too much into that passage, but it seems like there might be some hesitancy on Moses, which might have bled in uh, to, to the others. But then we jump down to verse 26 and they give the report and they they come back and it says in chapter 13 verse 27 they gave M Moses this account we went into land to which you sent us and it was it does flow with milk and honey here is its fruit but the people who live there are powerful and the cities are fortified and very large we even saw descendants of Anak there the Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. And Caleb, well, no later, surrounded by Joshua's message too, but he says, we should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. He understands with the help of God, but then they do not go in. Notice the, the mention of the Nephilim here in verse 33, which is a reflection back to the angels and women you find in Genesis, uh, which is, as we've said, somewhat mysterious, even bizarre. But you see the mention here again. And because this is in chapter 14, uh, you see some disobedience, and therefore they're going to be wandering. Uh, down in verse 26, we see of chapter 14, the penalty that's coming because of their questioning. Verse 27, how long will this wicked community grumble against me? I have heard the complaints of these grumbling Israelites. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you the very thing I heard you say. In this wilderness, your bodies will fall, 
every one of you, 20 years old or more, who was counted in the census and who has grumbled against me. Not one of you will enter the land, I swore with uplifted hand, to make your home, except Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, son of Nun. As for your children that you said would be taken in as plunder, I will bring them in to enjoy the land you have rejected. But as for you, your bodies will fall in the wilderness. Your children will be the shepherds here for 40 years, suffering for your unfaithfulness until the last of your body lies in the wilderness. For 40 years, one year, for each of the 40 days you explore the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. So here are the people who have betrayed God, who have said, we're not going to do this. They haven't trusted him. And he says, well, for every month, for every day, um, this is going to turn into years. Now we go down to verse 41 of the same chapter. And it says, Moses said, why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will not succeed. Do not go up because the Lord is not with you. You will be defeated for your enemies. For the Am Amalekites and the Canaanites will, uh, will face you there. Because you have turned away from the Lord, he will not be with you and you will fall by the sword. So God has told them, because of your sin, you're going to be wandering in the wilderness. So don't even try to go in. Well, it, it's, it's like children go, no, 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 no. Let me, let me have another chance. Let me have another chance. And this is where they are. And Moses warns them and says, do not go up. Because as we've experienced, I could imagine Moses saying here, I have experienced the Malachi, Amalekites when I've raised my staff, then I've seen the victory because God has anointed that and, and shown us that he is there. But now God says, I'm not going to be with you in this. You have to wait for 40 years. But it says, nevertheless, verse 44, in their presumption, they went up toward the highest point in the hill country, though neither Moses nor the Ark of the Lord, co Lord's covenant moved from the camp. And then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and attacked them and beat them down all the way to Horma. So we find this understanding that they didn't understand, that they didn't take God at his word. Then we go to chapter 20. And this, as I mentioned in last week's class, is where we find that Moses is also punished. And not because he doubted to go in but because of his disobedience to God. In chapter 20, verse 6, we're going to read that through verse 12. It says, Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance of the tent of Midian and fell face down. The glory of the Lord appeared to them. The Lord said to Moses, take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. So the people have been asking for water and now they're going to receive the water. They're going to receive the sustenance. And notice the words we've talked about. It says, speak to the rock. Verse nine. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence, just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock. And Moses said to them, listen, you rebels. Must we bring you water out of the rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out in the community and their livestock drink. So God answered his promise. He's going to take care of the people. But a couple things we see here. Moses struck the rock instead of speaking to it. And notice what he says in reference to himself and his brother Aaron. Listen, you rebels, he's saying to the Israelites. Must we, Aaron and I, bring you water out of this rock. He's angry with them. He's had an anger problem before. He has it now. And he doesn't say anything about God. He doesn't reference God in that particular sentence. He says, must we do this? And in verse 12, we see the result. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into land I will give them. The, these were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he was proved holy among them. Meribah is the word for quarreling. And so there was a lot of dispute there, a lot of discord. And we're going to see this throughout scripture. The next book, the final book of the Torah, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, is 
the Torah, in that Torah, rather, is Deuteronomy, a, another telling. And I want to talk about some of the aspects that your book talks about. It says, three powerful speeches by Moses, 40 years after the Lord had delivered Israel from Egypt are preserved in the book of Deuteronomy. So it's important to know that there are, or speeches going on here by Moses. The, the literary setting says Deuteronomy shares many affinities with literature from the Near East. The most evident is in its relationship to the various collections that have been recovered. These collections have come from as early as 2000 BC and before, and goes on to talk about other pieces of information as well. We find that there are sentenced to wander. I'm going to find that again in chapter one. Don't be thrown when you have the um, the repeat in these books. Again, you go back and think of the JEDP theory, where there's four sources. Uh, Moses being involved in this is the primary source, uh, but the two sources are named after different uses of God, and we talk about this this priestly one as well in this historical writing, um, Deuteronomic, uh, this another telling, J-E-P-D. Uh, now this is a book devoted to this retelling, telling again of much of the same story. Uh, so in reviewing numbers, make sure you got those blanks correct. It's tribes and land, importance of Passover, Canaan explored, and Moses's penalty. Now these blanks, the sentence, they are sentenced to wander, sentenced to wander. And then we also talk about the next, um, that is the calf, the golden calf. And it is similar to the Egyptian bull god, Apis, A-P-I-S. Now this was discussed in class last week and there's a good, good amount of information that at least the image itself was fresh on their mind from living in Egypt so long, but whether they were actually wanting to worship Apis or wanted to worship God through a familiar form uh, is the, is the debate is the question. It does seem like Aaron in most cases, even though he doubts God at times is not pagan in his worship. So at least from the fact that Aaron's the one that helps him build this thinks we think he's making a religious compromise. In other words, I know we're supposed to worship God alone However, uh, since you know this type of image, we can use it to point to God, and God clearly says that is not the way to be. In you in the in the book of Deuteronomy, over in chapter twenty, um, we're going to see some some rules of war. Now, these are important because. One of the things that the Old Testament is full of is violence. There's a lot of challenging questions when it comes to violence. The, the quick answer to this again, when people ask the question, why was there so much battle? Why were whole towns wiped out? Why were whole people groups wiped out, including their livestock at times? Well, again, the promises to Abram, land and people. And as you know, throughout world history, when there is land, there normally is people on it. And when another nation or tribe or group comes and wants that land, there is either a peaceful exit of the ones who were there or there's war. And so in the Old Testament, we see lots of war. You see a, a couple instances where if you just let us walk through peacefully, we'll leave you alone. And they don't do that. And the results are in the war. But again, this is a theological discussion that happens a lot. But for our purposes in Old Testament history, we just want to notice that, yes, there's a lot of war. But there were rules to it. So it wasn't that you just go out and do what you want, take anybody's life, take anything you want. Uh, this was a, a God-designed activity, and they need to do it within his parameters. It says, when you go to war against your enemies and see horses and chariots and an army greater than yours, do not be afraid of them. So the first charge is don't be afraid. Because the Lord your God who brought you up out of Egypt will be with you. When you're about to go into battle, the priest shall come forward and address the army. So this is... Not a separation church and state type of situation. This is a religious war. He shall say, hear, Israel, today you're going into battle against your enemies. 
Do not be faith hearted or afraid. Do not panic or be terrified by them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies and to give you victory. It goes on to say uh, in verse 10, when you march up to attack a city, make its people an offer of peace. That's what I was talking about earlier. If they accept and open the gates, all the people in it shall be subject to forced labor and shall work for you. If they refuse to make peace and they engage you in battle, lay siege to that city. When the Lord your when the Lord your God delivers it into your hand, put to the sword all the men in it. As for the women, the children, the livestock, and everything in the, else in the city, you may take these as plunder for yourself, and you may use the plunder the Lord your God gives you from your enemies. This is how you are to treat all the cities that are at a distance from you and do not belong to the nations nearby. So again, difficult questions that we don't have time to answer today, but we do want to recognize that these people were going to take over land that God had given them, and they were going to be along the way taking people with them that perhaps didn't want to go, and there's some challenges there. Then we next blank is this idea of renewal the renewal of things that they have been, they have neglected God and now they need to to start fresh to start anew 26 verse 16 it says the lord your god commands you this day to follow these decrees and laws careful carefully observe them with all your heart and with all your soul you have declared this day that the lord your god is your God, and that you will walk in obedience to him, and that you will keep his decrees, commands, and laws, that you will listen to him. And the people have declared this day that you are his people, his treasured possession, as he promised, and that you are to keep all his commands. He has declared that he will set you in praise, fame, and honor, high above all the nations he has made, and that, and that you will be people holy to the Lord your God, as he promised. There's this wonderful promise, again, this covenant idea that God is on their side. Not that they're perfect, but again, in his sovereign choice, he chose his people. And so therefore, he's going to work through them when they have it right and also through their imperfections so he can make a people for himself. I want to talk a little bit about covenants as we think about this text, because if you're going to go on to chapter seven, they, they build an altar. And then in verse eight, it says, you shall write very clearly all the words of this law on the stones you've set up. So he's saying, I need you to keep a record of this. I need you to remember that this is a covenant. I want your descendants to remember this. There is an article that is important for us to think about covenants. And we see some in Genesis. We see some in Jeremiah. We see in different places. But the Bible often speaks of covenants, agreements, pacts, alliances, or treaties between individuals or groups of equal or unequal standing. Now, a few of these ideas of covenants, one was cutting a sacrificial in animal in half and walking through, symbolic of walking through the two parts, pledging loyalty and unity. Other was eating a meal together. You see this in Genesis 26, uh, giving gifts as part of a covenant, 1 Samuel 18. Uh, they're setting up a rock or a stone pile if you grew up in a church that sang hymns, you may know I raise mine Ebenezer. This is what an Ebenezer is, a rock of remembrance that God has made his covenant and we are to stick with it. Um, handshakes, uh, giving someone a sandal, which is in Ruth 4, handshakes, 2 Kings 10. And then the most significant covenant in the Old Testament took place in Mount Sinai where God reveals himself. The covenants are important for us to know in the sense that they are helpful for us to find confidence in a God. We're going to go now on to Deuteronomy chapter 31 and 32. And this is where we find the transfer of leadership, where we find Moses handing over the leadership of the people to a man named Joshua. And in 31, Verse one, it says, then Moses went out and spoke these words to all of Israel. I am 120 years old and I'm no longer able to lead you. The Lord has said to me, you shall not cross the Jordan. 
The Lord your God himself will cross over ahead of you. He will destroy the nations before you and you will take possession of your land. Joshua also will cross over ahead of you, as the Lord said. The Lord will go, will do to them what he did in Sion and Og, the kings, the Amorites, whom he destroyed along with their land. What's going on here is this powerful charge to the people from Moses saying, I'm not going to be your leader anymore. I've lived a long life. God has said, your job is done. And then he does Joshua a favor by setting him in motion and saying, here's your leader. This, this man's your new leader. I, I can think of this personally where I have been at Rabbit Creek Church as a senior pastor uh, since 2008. And the way that worked is uh, from June until August, the founding pastor, Terry Hill, uh, was with me. We both were at the church. And he did an outstanding job of working with me over those two and a half months or so. And then he made it clear along the way with people that Mark is now your pastor. I'm moving. Mark is now your pastor. And that gave me a great starting place that many pastors don't have when they go into a church. And this is what Joseph, uh, excuse me, Joshua gets. And in chapter 31, verse 7, after he has talked to the people, he talks to Joshua. And it says, then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the presence of all Israel. So they were able to eavesdrop. It says, be strong and courageous, for you must be with this people and must go with these people into the land that the Lord swore to their ancestors to give them. And you must divide it among them as their inheritance. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Very classic examples of Moses' inspirational speech that sets Joshua up for victory and success. Now I'll take a break with this video and then start recording the second video. So make sure you watch each of the lectures and always reach out with questions.